Welcome to the Authentic Cinema Podcast, Episode 7. Today we're going to be talking about Rob Reiner's 1986 film, Stand By Me. I'm joined, as always, by my good friend and co-host, Bob Lyron. Bob, how are you? I'm doing good, man. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is this like, does this make for a great birthday to record the Authentic Cinema Podcast on your birthday? To be honest with you, I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing today. Let's just be honest. Sitting yeah. around with your best bud talking about Authentic Cinema on yeah. your birthday is a pretty choice way to spend the day. I totally get it. And I think part of the gift is the film that we're going to talk about today as well, Stand Absolutely. By Me. I think it's really like a, it's a, I think it's the perfect film for some reason to do on my birthday. Absolutely. A film of timeless film about reflection. Yeah, about like memory and, and time and, and relationships and all that kind of stuff and, and childhood. I think one of the great things about doing the way we do it, which is we alternate picks, is like sometimes the other person makes a pick and you're like, hell yeah, right on. <laughs> and then other times the person makes a pick and you're like, huh, really? Yeah. And and so we kind of went into that. We had a little bit of that last last episode when I picked The Killer. I think at first you were kind of like, The Killer? Okay, interesting. And I yeah. think w for me with this one, you're like, you know, you told me a couple weeks ago, like, let's we're going to do Stand By Me. And I'm like, okay, Stand By Me. Yeah, the movie from when I was a kid. Yeah, I've seen it a bunch of times. Yeah. You know, like, authentic cinema? And then, of course, I rewatched it and I'm like, Oh, yeah, of course. So the thing I wanted to say about it is that I think that when we talk about authentic cinema, which we do every episode, that's so closely aligned with like this idea of like auteur cinema, which is like yeah. the filmmaker is the author of the movie. And that just like naturally leads itself to like these like deep questions that the film is challenge posing challenging ideas. And it's, yeah. you know, it's like almost like an author's statement on a topic and and this mm. movie i think with the reason i had a little bit of like trepidation right at first i was like is there really like any any sort of like profound ideas here mm. but i think that there absolutely is and that's one of the mm. amazing things about it is that it's not this like esoteric examination of the human condition where the auteur director makes this profound discovery or statement it's not that it but it is absolutely this might be the most authentic film we've done it's funny, I used to see it all the time on television in the 90s, like late 80s, mm -hmm. 90s. It was always on television, which it's funny because it was always edited. So like they edited out all the foul language. Recently, though, I was like, man, I was trying to think of movies we could watch as a family. I have a five-year-old son, and, and I was like, I'd love to watch Stand By Me. I love that movie. And I didn't have it in mind for the podcast or anything like that. I was just like, that's such a, just a great movie. And so I, I put it on, and I realized like, oh my God, like... It's rated R. <laughs> I never knew that. I, I never realized that. I was watching. I was like, certainly by like sort of helicopter parenty, like 21st century standards. Like, yeah, this there's some really challenging stuff here, like kids with guns mm -hmm. and, you know, um, mm -hmm. dead kids Smoking. and they're swearing yeah. like sailors and, and everything. But I was like, there really isn't anything in this film that's like that out of out of control. But anyway, we were watching it and I, I, would, I kind of had the same reaction you did. Uh, I was just like. Oh my God, this is such a beautiful movie and absolutely one of the most authentic films I think I've ever seen. Absolutely. It's, it's interesting because it's a film about a memory of childhood. And yet I saw this film so many times when I was a kid. It's like kind of foundational in my own memories of my own childhood. Although I still think it's funny. I think I always used to just see it on television. So it's like... <laughs> edited so i i just feel like the fact that the kids like swear in it and everything like that is such a big part of the dynamic of this movie you touched on like one of the major i think talking points of this movie which is you said you know it's sort of like almost foundational in your own childhood and yeah. i think that that's kind of the idea and that's why this movie is not only timeless but yeah. it's it's absolutely rewatchable you you any 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 american that watches this movie is going to not only identify with it, but continue to rediscover it every time they watch it. In other words, when you watch it as like a 13 or 14 year old, you're like, oh my gosh, this is just like me. And then when you watch it in your 20s yeah. and your 30s or your 50s or whatever, you're always going to identify with it. And I think that's one of the reasons it's timeless is that they actually captured, and that's what makes it so authentic, is that they captured something that's totally sincere and real 
about yeah. the, 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 that, that just like that perfect time in a young boy's life, basically like 12 years old. It's essentially right before boys discover girls. That's what this, that's the yeah. thing is like right before you discover girls, you're like your buddies are your entire universe and like everything yeah. that you do revolves around them and the things that you learn, the things that you, you try to do that yeah. all the experiences you have are usually revolved around this really core group of individuals and they sort of serve as a foundation for the rest of your life. And I think that that's why you can continue to revisit this movie decades in between and still totally identify with it and why it hits as hard in 2023 as it did in 1986 when it came out and probably in 1959 when it was set. Like my memories of it actually as a kid is like, again, watching it on television. So I wouldn't always see it from the very beginning. I would turn on the television and, oh, it'd be like, oh, Stand By Me's on. And it would right. be the scene with the leeches or it would be the train track right. scene. Or it was one of those films that you can kind of just like jump into at any point And like, it just sucks you in. It just absorbs you. And I was even thinking earlier in preparation for this podcast, you know, I was like writing down like key scenes in the movie. And this is one of those films that's like, <laughs> every scene is a key scene. Yeah. You could make an argument yeah. that every single scene in the film is... Is, is key. I don't think I ever saw this film like straight through, to be honest, from, from beginning to end until I maybe was even in my 20s. I would only see it in very fra in like fragments. Um, it's possible that I saw, I probably did see it. I, I do think I remember watching this at like Phil Hutton's house, like all the way through one night on a sleepover. Uh, around the age of 12. But most of my memories of it are always sort of catching it halfway through or catching it at the end. And every scene is almost like so rich. It's almost like each little scene could almost be its own little short film. But the other thing that you're talking, what, what else did you say? Like just now you were saying that it's timeless. It takes place in 1959 in a small town in Oregon. But it also like, yeah, it's also like, I, I think we, we could both say it's like also considered to be like kind of a fundamental or like a foundational like 80s movie. Like there's something about yeah. it that makes me think of the 80s and I'm a child of the 80s. Uh, but yeah, you can watch it again in 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 2023, and yeah, it's it's a it's a film that that seems to to exist like outside of time. Like you said, it's like a, it, it feels like it's like this quintessential 80s movie, and I think that what that speaks to is this idea of like its popularity when it came out. But yeah. more importantly, I think that what it captures, which is what we just kind of touched on, and we're going to get into more, is this this quintessential uh, preteen. Yes, that's a, okay. Ad, yes. Adolescent experience, and and the 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 the, the most um, uplifting and sort of reassuring thing about that is that that hasn't changed. So from yeah. from essentially 1959 up, and believe me, up until now, I mean, you have a young son, and and in a few years, he's going to essentially be having the same experiences that these boys had, and that's something that I think is wholly American. Is yeah. that basically for the better part of like 60 years that that young adolescent boys are having the exact same experiences it might be slightly different with technology but for the most part it's about self-discovery it's about exploring you know having um experiences of of, of adult human emotions it's about challenging yeah. yourself and 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 coming to terms and like i said it's all it's all on the cusp of puberty and that's just this really super fine window of time when it's like a mixture of like innocence and acknowledgement and vision of like a bigger world i.e like death you're starting to become aware of your your own mortality right right it's like a film about in a way about like thresholds or like bridges i would say like it's the last moments of childhood i'm gonna like jump to the very end of literally the last thing in the film and okay uh i think it it sums up in a way what we're talking about i never had any friends like the ones i had when i was 12 Jesus, does anyone? It's a great last line of the movie. And I think that the, the, the beauty of, of the line is, is that, you know, it's universally true. But also what's important is that I, I had that group of friends when I was 12. And I bet you did too. Yeah. And, and everybody did. But here's the important thing. I'm not really friends with those guys anymore. In other words, we're not talking about lifelong friendships that you're going to have until you're in your you know middle ages and late middle ages. Like I'm still fr yeah. best friends with the group because you grow up. That's what I'm saying. It's like yeah. you said, it's a ridge, it's a cusp, and like you change once you hit puberty, and then people start doing different things, and those people disappear from your life. And 
the beauty is that it's not a like, you know, you and I have been friends for over 20 years, but we didn't meet when we were 12. And if we had met when we were 12, there's a good chance we wouldn't be friends now because our lives would have taken different paths and we would have we would have missed. It's like uh, I think there's another line in the movie where he's like, sometimes you have friends that are like bus boys. Yeah, they come in and out of your life like bus boys. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think that that the the point the reason we're talking about this movie is you hit it is that like it's just such an important window of time where those friends because of where we are as as human beings and and the experience we're having being exposed to the larger world is sort of cements it cements that in our brain and so you move on from those people but you don't move on from the experiences i can remember whole days that i spent with my friends at that age yeah but i'm not friends with those people anymore you know what i mean like yeah the experiences are what matter yeah i think to kind of bring it back to the you know the the traditional acp question of why did i select this film and we've been speaking to this uh, already but it is the most uh authentic portrayal of childhood that i've ever seen children are treated with the same dignity that adults are treated with in normal quote unquote, you know, grown up movies, like a, a standard mm-hmm. adult drama. And they're also portrayed mm-hmm. as kids behave. The movie opens up and there's these kids sitting in a treehouse, you know, smoking cigarettes and they're swearing like sailors. And right. I wasn't smoking cigarettes at 12, but I was definitely swearing like a sailor with my friends. <laughs> You're trying out all the swear words. Yeah. Right? You know, fuck this, fuck that. But also not just the fact that they're swearing, like it's, it's also like the way they're, they're like teasing each other. Like you show affection by like ripping on each other. Yeah. They're learning how to, they're learning how to interact with people their own age. You know, it's not like, little kids where they're like, you know, before that age, there's just mostly like parallel existence. You, you exist next to other five-year-olds or seven-year-olds or nine-year-olds, but you don't have any sophistication to actually interact on a, on a level that's comparable to the rest of your life. But at that age of like 12 to 13, that's when you actually start practicing the art of interacting with your peers that you're going to carry with you. And I think just to, to piggyback on the point you made, I think another thing, another reason that it does such an it's the sort of apex of like capturing childhood is that the dialogue and the way that they interact is it's probably the most impressive thing about the film is how authentic it is because so many times we watch movies about um young adults teenagers and it's essentially a version of what we wish we would have been like. I right. wish that I could have talked like this or had this experience <laughs> yeah. or done this. And it's never real. That's not, re- you know, you can't have sophisticated, witty banter that, yeah. you know, overcoming these obstacles with, per- that's not how the world works. Okay. That's, that's not, we, not, we wish it did. And yeah. when we think back on our teenage years or our adolescent years, we wish that it was a certain way, but it's not. And this film doesn't do that. It doesn't placate to this idea of what childhood is. It actually right. shows you what kids are like yeah and and i think the other thing we could say about it is there's no cliches two of these characters end up later on we find out like one of them like has really severe mental health problems in and out of jail like is kind of a failure right. the other guy is murdered you know the other guy's like a forklift operator like they're in other words like it doesn't just end up okay for everybody they're just real people sure it also doesn't it doesn't wind up with perfect little moments which is so no. many films like it's it's this it it happens where like the first kiss or like right. no this is this it's all it's all just it's all a process from when the the four boys decide to go out on this this day and a half long trip to go find a dead body until they return back to town and all goes separate ways it's all that's all part of it's all one process in other words it's not just like oh he beat up the bully and now we're good. You know, it's not like that. And each one of these kids, each one of them kind of has their own sort of like complex circumstances that they're dealing with. Do you think that each kid in their own way represents like an archetype of like the classic American sort of like values? You know, because I was thinking about each each of the four boys is different. One of them's like the silly, funny, funny one. One of them's like kind of aggressive and edgy, but clearly intelligent. One of them is very reserved, but like also like uh very observant and in touch with his feelings and one of them is just like 
mature for his age and very wise to the world in almost a detrimental way. And I was kind of like, each one of them to me feels like this archetype for like what an American can be. Yeah. I mean, maybe not even, I would just push it farther and say it's maybe that sort of aspect isn't even like distinctly American. I think just maybe those are the way like friend groups find each other. I mean, I could look back at my group of friends at 12 and probably kind of line them up a little bit within those archetypes. Mm -hmm. But what's important about it in the story is it creates this great dynamic and it's a very realistic dynamic. And each one of them kind of contribute something and and each one of them it, there's also things that are kind of holding them back <laughs> you know that they kind of mm-hmm. help each other out and a lot of what's going on in this film is how they support each other how they're, they're there for each other you know they're always ripping on each other and insulting each other and but they clearly like really deeply care about each other they're kind of like their own little family when you watched it or when you were thinking about stand by me did you were there like prevailing themes that came to mind or like important motifs or ideas that you think kind of dominate the movie now that you're watching it all these years later? Yeah, I think that there's there's the theme again of like the confrontation with death, like seeing death. You know, the, the boys are going out to see a dead body, which to me is sort of symbolic of like they're going to go out and see reality. There's nothing more real than death. Right. And there's nothing that's going to put the rest of your life into perspective like death. The big thought that I had that I just keep coming back to when I was watching it is, again, this idea of world. You know, you're in this like boyhood world. You're in their world. And we're seeing this entire story from the child's perspective and how they understand the world. And what's interesting about it is that they've kind of met they're at that age right like where they've kind of mastered their world you know they know exactly exactly. who they are in their world right but now it's time to like now the dead body what it does is it sort of forces them to kind of push out now into the unknown into into a world that doesn't that they don't belong to. And there's that great scene that I think it, it kind of evokes this, I guess when Vern, he's under the, under his house at the beginning, he's telling the guys about like what, about the body and how he knows about yeah. it. And it, it, you know, it yeah. flashes back to him under his house. And there's this great shot where he's looking through the fence, right? Like, and it's framed in mm-hmm. this like diamond from that kind of crosshatch fencing under the, yeah. under the house. And he sees his older brother and his friend like, like talking about the body and it, and it shows his eye. And I had this idea of like, yeah, it's like he's now, he's looking out, out into that other world now. Right. Right. Looking from behind the gate out into this other world. And he's about to go, you know, this sparks the journey. One thing in, in Vern's defense, because he's kind of like, he's not like dumb, but he's kind of like the airhead, you know? <laughs> yeah, he's kind of goofy. He's goofy. <laughs> you know, he's like, I brought a comb, guys. <laughs> but he's also like, he's the one who starts all this. He's this was kind of his idea. <laughs> he found out yeah. about it, you know? He's the one who comes up with the whole thing. But um, something that is also interesting that kind of came to my mind, and I it might or may not be related, but uh, there's also this sense in the film, you know, talking about Ray Brower, right? The, the missing kid, Ray mm-hmm. Brower. He's been on the news the whole time. Everybody's looking for Ray Brower. They interrupt like the, you know, the fifties doo-wop to like have the report about Ray Brower. They still can't find him. Right. And it occurred to me, I've, I've watched this film like three times this week. And it occurred to me today when I was watching it again, <laughs> only the kids can find Ray Brower. Only the, the children are going to be able to really find Ray Brower because Ray Brower is a kid too. And so right. they they understand his world, you know. They understand what could have happened to Ray Brower better than the adults do because they would kind of do the same things that he does. You know, he follows the railroad tracks down and into the forest by the river and gets hit by the train and gets knocked out of his kids. But like there there's something to the film. I think it's obviously not stated overtly, but there's this sort of idea I was detecting of like, yeah, only only the children will be able to find Ray Brower. They can find something that the adults can't, right? They can see something that the adults can't. Totally true. And the the interesting thing about the death motif is I think that, like you said, that's like the, the one the, the thing that they have to kind of, they're, they're so comfortable in their own world that they have to like step out of their world to kind of start experiencing the real world. I thought that was really insightful. But one of the things that occurred to me while you were saying that was that, oh, the, the journey is almost analogous to like, the lifeline 
preceding death because like when the journey starts it's all like fun and happy and they're singing songs and then and then what happens is they start they start experiencing challenges real life threatening challenges and by the time they get to the end and they actually and they 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 come across like real obstacles like the train sequence and like ace and the gang of like they're like literally threatening to kill them and then like by the end of the film they're literally faced with like life and death situations where they're like holding a gun and like by the end they find the body and it's totally almost anticlimactic it's not funny anymore it's not like oh this is going to be great you know we're going to go on this adventure it's like very sobering and then of course like the end of the scene is like they're all standing in town and then they just they all kind of part ways and it's it's almost just like note perfect sort of like representation of like Oh, the idea of death versus the reality of death. And they experience all of that in like, you know, 36 hours. But one more sort yeah. of note that I had or one more idea I had about death is I also think that it the, the theme of death is different for each of the four characters. And in particular through Gordy, because, you know, Gordy yeah. has this whole sub sub story of like his older brother died. And his older brother was his hero. His older brother was the hero of, of essentially like the whole town. Yeah. The entire town knew. And his older brother was clearly the preferred son of his parents. Yeah, he was the golden boy. This He was the golden boy. I mean, even Ace, who's like, you know, this archetype villain of the movie. Even at one point in the movie, he says, like, don't you have any of your brother's good sense? Like, even he respected Gordy's brother. I think that the journey to, to Ray Brower is particularly it's a catalyst for Gordy because he needs the closure. Yes. He needs the closure on death. And so he has to go find that body. And in fact, as the movie progresses at each different turn, when they face a different obstacle, I think each one of the three other buddies, Chris and Vern and um, Teddy, Teddy, right. Each one of them tries to turn back and he's like, we're not, we're going to finish this. And clearly his motivations are, are tied up with like, with coming to terms with his father and like, you know, his, the way, his, the way his dad treats him and the way his dad's like sort of rationalizing his brother's death. But anyway, the, the, the motif or the theme of death weighs heavy on this film. And it's amazing how they're able to use it in such creative ways to kind of propel the story forward. There's a great quote, by the way, when he's getting the lunch meat and the guy at the, um, the deli. Yeah. The little deli grocer thing, you know, he's talking about his brother, you know, he's, you yeah. play football too. And he's like, no. And he yeah. says, Bible says in the midst of life, we are in death. Like we're, death is already here. Your death is always in front of you. Your death is always right. going to define your experience. And like, yeah, I mean, we can't say that it's the first time he's thought about death because his older brother died, but he, it's like he couldn't comprehend it. Well, he said he couldn't cry at the funeral and it really weighs on him. He couldn't process it. And he needs to go see that body because he's, he's looking at the reality of what happened to his brother. But there's also this idea of like this world that they belong to, this world that they've mastered, this childhood world. You know, they're at 12. They know who they are. They got their clubhouse. They got their cigarettes. They're playing cards. They know how to talk shit. Each one knows their role. You know what I mean? Like, I think the journey to Ray Brower is how about how that world has to die now. Right. When they go look at Ray Brower, they're saying goodbye to their childhood. I mean, there's a clear symbol, right? It's a dead kid. But what I love about this film too, dude, is it's not like these guys all have perfect lives. All of them in certain ways have had to like grow up probably faster than certainly I did. Chris Chambers has a kind of a, you know, he's just known as being like a bad kid. You know, he comes from a bad family. His dad drinks too much. Oh yeah, coming from a bad family. Right? Yeah, and then uh, Teddy Duchamp, like his dad's like crazy. Like he tried to burn his ear off, you know. like these. In right. other words, these kids don't come from these like ideal Idealic. backgrounds. Gordy's right. brother died, but like also, even before his brother died, he was invisible to his parents. They're, he's invisible to them. So all of these kids come from really kind of difficult circumstances. What I love about this film and what's so dynamic about it actually is it it is a children's movie, but it's so dangerous. This world is dangerous that they're in, you know? Like there's right. always consequences in this film. These kids aren't protected, coddled little kids. In fact, they're almost like by our own, I would say, 21st century standards, almost like neglected. Their parents don't know what they're doing. What I'm really trying to say is that it's a children's movie, but there's real danger in it. There are real stakes. They could really get killed. Well, they I mean, they literally face life, life-threatening situations they almost get run over by a train absolutely the journey they're going on is actually very dangerous i'm the father of a five-year-old if in six years he like 
went off down some train tracks for three days, I'd be worried sick about it. <laughs> Although I'd also kind of be proud of him. <laughs> but my point is like, it's not, and, and again, I think what makes this authentic, you know, is it's, it's not this like safe, sanitized version of childhood. Right. There are real stakes. None of these kids are perfect. Each one kind of carries a trauma. I think that there's like a there's like a gravity there's a gravity and a weight to not only the story but also like the performances of the of the four actors. And let's just say it: if these kids if they don't land the ship, this movie doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. And so I think that at some point we could just talk briefly about the River Phoenix aspect to this because, you know, River Phoenix, he's been dead longer than he was alive. You know, he died at 23 and he's been dead for whatever, 27 years, something like that. But like he brings such a maturity and a gravity to his performance and yeah. it speaks to what you're talking about. There is real danger here. And it's not these just idealistic kids that are, are none the wiser. Yeah. He commanded attention from the viewer because it was so real. And also that plays into like the direction by Rob Reiner and the script. You know, I, I think I mentioned it before, but just, just, just as an aside, the, the dialogue in this is just it's just perfect. Like it, it, it owes itself to the to the screenwriter, but also to the acting, like the way yeah. that they make fun of each other. Like, even though they're using these 1950s, like, oh, that's so boss. Like, we don't say that anymore. <laughs> I love it when, when uh, Vern is always saying, no, sincerely. <laughs> yeah, sincerely. Like, this is so boss, guys. Oh, my gosh. It's so boss. Okay. But, like, the thing is, when he says it, you're like, yeah, that's that's exactly probably what they talked like. And the way he's delivering it is no perfect. But to get back to River Phoenix, I think that, like, he is sort of like the um, – I don't know if he's the emotional anchor of the film. The story is told through Gordy's eyes, but it's Chris's emotional weight. And I think that that's obviously just a testament to River Phoenix. I mean, this is a guy that has been rightfully sort of canonized in his, you know, in the 30 years since he died as just like someone, you know, he's almost like a generational talent. And it, we're blessed that we get this movie yeah, we got a glimpse. At that age to see him do this. And it's amazing what he's able to convey. I mean, the milk money scene is the one that everyone points to as like, it's just, you know, like, I mean, there's there, there's adult <sighs> actors that can't, you know, I we, we read this, uh, we read the oral history, we both read the oral history. And I think Rob Reiner said something really interesting, which is like, child actors don't have a craft. Yeah. Okay? They haven't been doing it long enough to have craft. They either got it or they don't. Okay, they can either kind of like, deliver it but they don't know how they're doing it and it almost seems like at, i don't know how old river phoenix was when they made the movie maybe he was like 15 but like he's got it he has the emotional maturity of an of someone twice his age well i agree like this film only works because these these kids like their performances are just off i mean they're just magic i mean they're just beautiful performances these are not easy characters to play and they are incredibly well directed and we shouldn't forget that and rob reiner did something really important which is he got these kids together for like a month before shooting and he threw them into a viola spolin class and Viola Spolin is a is a famous theater teacher. Actually, one of my teachers in school like studied with her directly. And it's all about play, you know, playing together. And what I think he understood that, that's really important is that he these guys actually became friends in real life. They really developed a chemistry, a real chemistry. And then I think that helped unlock the performances that they give. But to talk about River Phoenix, what he has, the depth, the emotional depth, and in the milk, the milk money scene, that's way deeper than you usually will see like a child actor go. The way he sort of mm -hmm. just connects that down all the way to his very soul. Right. You know, I think what River Phoenix has in this film, and this character is so interesting, is this just incredible, we'd say vulnerability. Like, he's just so vulnerable, right. emotionally vulnerable, meaning, like, he can access all these different emotions. And what, what a complex character. And I think River Phoenix is perfect for this. Chris Chambers is a kid who had to grow up too fast. Right. And he actually, like, he understands who he is, you know. And that scene with the milk money is he just needs to escape, you know. He understands what right. he sort of symbolizes in the community. 
and how unfair that is, how he'll never be able to get out of it. Another famous, like, or another scene that I think maybe isn't as talked about, but I actually, I don't want to say I like it better. It doesn't matter. They're both gorgeous scenes. But the scene where, like, Gordy, they're walking, and he's like, fuck writing. Right. And he wants to take shop class. And Chris Chambers is like, don't say that, Gordy. And he tells him, like, listen, you have a gift. You have a real gift. You need to protect that. And, like, fuck your dad. Right. It's his problem. Don't go and be in, in a shop class. That's for people like me in Teddy. Right. This character has this incredible maturity. He deeply cares about his friend and he's giving him good advice, you know, but from a perspective that like a kid that age shouldn't have. What's so amazing about not only the characters in this movie, but also the actors is that they act exactly like what kids are like. Chris Chambers is, like you said, he's been forced to grow up and he doesn't even fully understand it yet, but he's able to articulate it. Yeah. Okay, And like they have real conversations like those kids would have. And they have like these little moments where their adult sort of like perspective is starting to peek its head out from behind, you know, the childhood wonderment. And then they slip right back into like making jokes about each other's mom. What's also interesting, it's and I think what it touched on and made me remember is like, yeah, like my friends, they knew me way better than my parents did. <laughs> you know, right. like they right. knew who I really was. Like Gordy's dad, like doesn't know who he is. Gordy's dad potentially is like very angry at him for irrational reasons. Like he doesn't like him. He sees him as like the weak son, or you know, kind of at best, he's just kind of invisible. There's right. the great line where he's talking about Teddy after they escape the junkyard, and and Teddy flips out. He's like, I was trying to figure out why why Teddy cared so much about his dad who like tried to like murder him and burn his ear off. And like, right. I couldn't give a shit about my dad and he only got mad at me once. And that's when I drank bleach when I was like three. Yeah. <laughs> I was also like, well, you know, if you look at the behavior of Gordy's dad, like it's just a different form of kind of abuse. Yeah. It's emotional. The kind of abuse that Gordy has. He's not given attention. He's not even given, like, he's just invisible. And there's even says, like, that summer I was the invisible boy. Right. You brought up the scene that I wanted to talk about. I think it's like actually one of the most crucial moments. I mean, this, like you said, this film is filled with, and I think that's the beauty is what makes this movie so rewatchable, by the way, is it's like, it kind of fits my definition of a, of a rewatchable movie, which is like, when you flip it on a TV channel and it's on, you're just going to watch the rest of the movie from that point. OK, yeah, it's like wherever yes. they're at in the movie, I'm just I'm like, I'm in for the next 45 minutes, however, however much of, of the movie's left. If it's only been on for 10 minutes. I'm watching the rest. Oh, there's only 10 minutes left. I'm going to watch the rest. Yeah. So every scene carries weight. Every scene is crucial. But for me, I think one of the, the most crucial moments of a film just filled with these scenes is the junkyard scene, particularly mm. after like there's the fun part. Which is when, which is when Gordy returns with the the, the groceries and the and he, everyone's gone. I love that part when he kind of like walks back. Yeah. And he's like looking around. He's like, where the hell is everybody? And he looks over. They're over there jumping the fence. And then there's the whole chopper scene. And that's just it's just it's great. And then yeah. for me, after he gets over the fence and the junkyard owner comes up and is mad at them for teasing the dog. The next like 60 seconds to two minutes of that movie is just like, I'm like, holy shit. It hits so hard. Mm -hmm. And I think it just, the reason I wanted to bring it up was because of what you've been saying so far about how like the real world is coming at them. Yeah. They don't understand how fragile they are. They don't understand how exposed they are. And it's encapsulated in that scene when they're like, they're teasing the dog. And then the guy comes up and he's like, you know, the, the cranky old man that's like, don't tease that dog. Get away from here. And they're like, what are you going to do about it? Fat ass. You know, yeah. like, it's all fun and games until he makes it real. Yeah. He makes it real in a way that like when you're an adult, isn't it funny when you're an adult and you think back to your childhood and you think back to the way adults like you, everyone's got like one or two memories of like the way a, an adult behaved when I was a kid. And yeah. I'm like, now that I'm an adult, I have a reference. You're like, that was weird. Like that, that adult, yeah. I would never behave that way. Like I've got experiences from my own childhood when like one of my friend's parents said something to me or like it was, and now that I'm an adult, I'm like, that was ridiculous that they said that. Yeah. You know that's I mean? crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. And so this is, this is one of those scenes where this guy, you know, he's like pissed off and he starts identifying him. But like the way that he goes after Teddy is like, it's cruel. You're absolutely right. It's, it's just so cruel. All the adults in the film are cruel. All of them. Right. Gordy's dad is cruel to him. In every scene with the father, like he's, he's cruel. Yeah. 
you know, your friend, why are you friends with thieves? You know, and he's like, well, they're not right. thieves. And we stole milk, milk money. That's a thief to me. Just kind of right. cruel. The junkyard, you know, is cruel. The guy, the da- guy's dad burning off his ear, cruel. Right. Uh, in the milk money, he actually tries to return the money, but the, the teacher right. steals it from him and then uses his reputation. That's how she's able to steal the money. It's cruel. Even in the story within the story about the Barfarama, the fat kid, right? Like all the, adults, all the adults are cruel. Are cruel. He gets tripped. The host calls him a lard ass adults are always portrayed as these kind of cruel and kind of terrifying you know like there's a real yeah. like terror to this cruelty probably representative of like what the real world's like it's a cruel world out there once you lose this innocence of this childhood you called this junkyard this guy that owns the junkyard you called him a fat ass well now you're going to enter into the into the adult world and i think the thing that hit so hard about that scene was teddy's reaction you know teddy is just like blinded by a rage that he doesn't at his age doesn't understand he wants to like climb over the fence and, and kill the guy and then the guy just keeps antagonizing like loony loony yeah. loony. what hits me so hard at that scene is when they pull him off the fence and they're walking away and teddy's just like bawling yeah and he's like my father stormed the beaches of normandy you asshole yeah. in that moment his dad clearly is like a world war ii veteran that stormed the beaches of normandy that came back to america and he's just completely destroyed by the horrors of war yeah and it's now like totally maladjusted he's abusing his son they've been committed into a mental institution yeah. and he literally almost killed his son and burned his ear off on a stove how dark do we want to go here but like still teddy retains that childlike love like the purity of a child's love for their parent and that moment in the film i'm like you can't this is you can't you can't get any more just like no perfect than this so teddy is a teddy's a complex character feldman is really like really good in this man he was in all those 80s movies dude and and every time mm-hmm. i watch him in those movies like he's so awesome like he's so good and this this is my favorite of all his performances. I agree. This is a really special performance. He's really good. I know everybody always talks about River Phoenix, and they should. You know, like he's unbelievable. But Corey Feldman is he's doing stuff here that, that's beyond just being a kid. He really seems to understand the the pain and the rage. Well, I think that there's an anger that goes along with the Teddy character. Like you don't have to be a psychiatrist or even necessarily a parent to understand this idea that like children that are put under prolonged situations of, of stress and abuse, like they're gonna have residual problems. And I think the character of Teddy clearly has that. The unfortunate kind of like irony, I guess, is that what we subsequently learned through Corey Feldman's career is that his experience was kind of mirroring Teddy's experience. He was essentially like yeah. in a an abusive kind of household where he was being mentally and maybe even physically abused by his parents yeah. to kind of like propel him into as a child actor. And like, it's very tragic and sad. And it, it sent him it's, I mean, we t- we're talking about like this movie is about this idea of like the the sort of evolution of innocence in human beings and leaving the comfort zone and kind of joining the real world and all those kind of things. But unfortunately, it's almost like art imitating life in this case where this, you know, and it feels weird to say, but for kind of like for our enjoyment, he's able to kind of channel that stuff. In hindsight, we're like, I guess he was kind of channeling these things in a weird way, which makes it heavy to watch the movie. Yeah. But like you said, the, the the skill is there. The risk in this situation is like, okay, the guy understands how to have rage, right? right? But what's so impressive is that his performance is not one note. No, no, it's not. It's rich in texture. Teddy isn't always flipping out. He's not flying into rages all the time at all. No. No, his rage manifests itself in all kinds of different ways. You know, flinch, hit you twice, just the way he talks shit to his buddies. His character has like a level of sarcasm. Yeah. Sarcasm, jadedness, the scene where he jumps in front of the train and he's going to do the train dodge at the beginning and and Chris has to tackle him and take him off the tracks. Like, There's all these different ways that this comes out and it doesn't always come out in, in this white hot rage. What's so powerful about the junkyard scene is that's where you see it and it's like white hot intensity. There it right. is. And then we also experience the sort of full spectrum of his pain. And I also think that the the character of Teddy is so tragic. Like all this guy wants to do is be in the army so he can be like his dad, but because he has a burned ear and bad eyes and the burned ear is because of his dad, he can't get into the army. And there's that sort of like unresolved 
you know, like this doesn't work out well for Teddy in the end. We know we're told at the very beginning of the film in the, in the treehouse things aren't going to go well for Teddy, you know, and they don't, right. but I really want to give a shout out to Corey Feldman in this film. And I, I would say like, you know, the guy has his problems, but this yeah. performance is really a treasure and props as well to Rob Reiner, the textures that he gets out of the performances. These are not one note performances in any of these actors. It's almost like the irony that we've discovered about this movie is that all these people want to make that where when people make movies about kids, they want it to be like the kids like an adult. But it's like yeah. if you actually just make them kids as kids, the, everything that you were hoping for and trying to make them act like an adult is there. Because yeah. just because you're 12 doesn't mean that your world is any, there's not, there's not, there's less at stake. Yes. And that would be the mistake of, a, of an adult that thinks that just because they're 12, it doesn't matter. It does matter. This is their whole universe. Okay. What they're going through. And like, just to make it clear, we're also going to include scenes with like them getting run over by a, a train and pointing guns at people. Okay. And so like, it is real. And I think that what you're talking about or that idea is, is perfectly sort of encased in Corey Feldman's performance is that yeah. like, there is there is a, a a gravity and a seriousness and serious emotions that are pent up inside this boy and that that that, that are that are real that adults themselves have a hard time dealing with and what's interesting is his friends know how to handle him they know him so well so intimately that they know how to handle they know how to take care of him he also takes care of them in his own his own ways too and I keep coming back to this, like in, in a lot of the episodes we've done, this idea of care, how and why people care about each other and what it does to us when we care about each other. And I think there's a like the name of the film, right? Stand by me. Right. That's what they're doing. They're all standing by each other. None of these guys could go do this journey by themselves, by himself, like, but right. they can do it together and they all encourage each other and they all, they're only able to pull it off because they're all together. And it's because they care about each other. Like when you show people really caring about each other and the full complexity of that, the full emotional way of that, the full stakes of that, you know, because whenever you care about something, as soon as you start to care about someone or something, there are automatically going to be real stakes about that because those people could let you down. Those people could die. Those people could betray you. You are setting yourself out in a vulnerable position. And, and this whole film seems to s exist for me in that space, in that vulnerable space of care. Right. Well, I think that there's a certain level of sincerity as well. Yes. Like everything is, 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 is true and sincere. And that's, that's a, you know, that's on the top of the list when we're checking boxes of the, is this an authentic film is it has to be sincere, not only from the point of view of the, the person that writes it and directs it, but also from the perspective of the characters themselves in the movie, there's a level of sincerity. And like, that's, um, that's a, it's a, it's an incredibly dangerous way to try to make art. I mean, yeah. but it's the, it's the only, the only way out is through. Okay. Yeah. And if you really want to do something that's authentic and real, you have to be willing to not only look at yourself, but the characters within the movie have to be willing to look at themselves and, and to be sincere. Okay. And if, and, and guess what? Just deciding to do it, whether you're behind, whether you're the person that's creating it or you're the character in the film, just deciding to do it isn't enough. You actually have to pull it off. And yeah. what they do in this movie is they pull it off. It's an absolutely sincere story. I would say an honest. It's an honest look through a world as a child and not this like, again, sanitized, perfect sort of two-dimensional child's world. And kind of along those lines, I don't think this movie is actually about the loss of innocence per se. No. Because these none of these guys are that innocent, you know? No. And they don't lose anything. They don't lose any innocence. Teddy Duchamp lost his innocence when his dad burned his ear off. Yeah, there's, they don't lose it through the... They don't lose any innocence through the course of the movie. It's that childhood world that they've kind of come to understand themselves coming to an end and a new world right. beginning. It's achieved, I think, to touch on what you're saying from this, like, because it's told sincerely and it's told authentically. Well, I think that the death move, the death theme, the theme of death is that's why it has to be that way because it's, 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 it's about, like you said, that phase of life dying. And it's fitting that like at the end of the movie, you know, Gordy is literally faced with like a life and death situation where he has to threaten to kill someone, you know, in order for them to get out of this. Okay. And it's, it's all, and it's not heavy handed. It's not like tongue in cheek. It's, it's all done again, that's where that honesty and sincerity comes in. 
Well, they earn that moment. Within the world of this story, he could shoot him. Oh, well, and you think about from where they started and everything they went through and where they ended, that's where, that's exactly what's going to happen. And that's, that's where he found himself. And it's also after, like, that scene happens immediately after he has seen Ray Brower. He's seen the body of Ray Brower on the right. ground. He's seen death now. You know, this is why, to kind of go back, like, why the movie has lasted and it, and it endures through time and through generations and like you know this is everything that we're talking about is why this movie still hits as hard as it does you know 30 20 35 years later okay it's because of this honesty this sincerity and this idea that like it's a it's not about like it's not a coming of age story it's not about a loss of innocence it's about life okay it's it's about the life but it's just about life of a group of 12 year olds and how they're transitioning to the next phase and so you can, it, and you, you you open the pod by saying that you thought it was like a movie about memory, and I think that that's why a movie that came out in 1986 and that we're now in 2023, we're still talking about it. And there's a great quote that kind of I think that resonates with what you're saying, which comes from the beginning of the movie with Dreyfus's narration at the very beginning. He says, "It was a long time ago." but only if you measure it in terms of years. Right. Yeah, it's a long time ago, but if you measure it in terms of feeling or you measure it in terms of emotion or you measure it in terms of like memory, memory. Right. it's still right there. When you first, we first were kind of talking about this nonchalantly a couple of weeks ago, we said we were going to do this. You brought up time and I wrote down a thought. This is a note to self. I said, the film made me think of memory as something outside of time. Right. I mean, they are obviously like intricately connected into time, but like you can draw them forth those experiences. They're like, they're kind of always with you, right? All the time. The the experience is like kind of shaped who you are now, right? In that sense, it's still in your present because you are the like culmination of that experience. And I think that's probably why we can continue to revisit the movie today. And that's why it's like on the list and it's why people continue to talk about it and discover it with their own families or, or whatever. And I think that it's a testament to it's, it's like, I was thinking about it. I'm like, you, you know, you mentioned like the eighties and it was like, we came off the seventies where we were taking, you know, this was like the Artur decade of the seventies when we were like trying yeah. to use this, this medium as like our tours were using film as to like explore themes and make statements and all that kind of stuff. And the eighties was very much like a decade of like, commercialization yeah it went back to business (laughs) exactly but the beauty of the (laughs) but the the beauty is that like rob reiner like he 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 found the the match point of like the two worlds and like he he made a movie for seven and a half seven and a half million dollars that went on to make at the time like whatever 60 million dollars which was just ridiculous and and but but it stands the test of time more importantly so he was really like he really succeeded where so many people in the seventies, like when they were trying this out, they didn't. And I think that that's, again, just, just yet another reason why you can kind of revisit this movie decades later is that like, it's all there. Rob Reiner did it. I think we both read that article and how difficult it was for him to secure financing for this. He had it, then he lost it. He had to get it back. Norman Lear wrote him a check for 7 million. Cause he's like, I want to see this movie, you know, mm-hmm. but they had a very difficult, they shopped after they shot it. Like then they had a difficult time getting distribution for it they started with columbia they went to every single studio and then came back to columbia there was a new head of columbia and then he screened it at his house and then his daughter loved river phoenix so they like ended up purchasing the film so this was like a, it's almost like an indie film right it was independently yeah. financed and then it had to find distribution just like indie films do today what i also think is interesting and i think is common to a lot of the films that we've talked about so far is that it doesn't have a neat and tidy little genre. Right. So if you're trying to shop this around 1980s Hollywood, 1980s <laughs> business-centric Hollywood, right? right? Like, you have no right. major stars. We don't remember that now because, you know, River Phoenix, and you know, like all these guys became very famous. But also, I think more importantly, like, what what is this movie? It's not a comedy. It's not really a drama, though, right. either. It's not, not Ghostbusters. It's not a right. horror story, but it's scary. Like, right. it defies, a, again, a neat and tidy kind of category to put it into. Right. It, it occurred to me, actually, retroactively, but one of the reasons I wanted to select this movie is because one of my friends that I had that 
definitely belong to this group. Like he passed away last year. I don't want to go much farther except to just say like it's sort of helped with my healing process actually to watch this, film, right. to watch such an honest film about grief, about grieving, grieving for your friend, but grieving also for your childhood. Sure. I think that the, the, the idea of remembering and grief and celebrating and grieving yeah. it's they're, they're, they go hand in hand and i think that that's what this movie does is it just it bottles that it captures it in a in a in an, an hour and 90 an hour and 30 minute story and that's why we can continue to revisit it now it was a great pick man it was a really it caught me off guard at first but you, you made a great pick and, and I'm, I'm i actually feel better for having watched it and talk about it it just the movie now holds a much higher standard in my head now that i've seen it and had this conversation stephen king actually said that this is his favorite adaptation of one of his stories. And apparently after he saw it, like it was screened for him the first time, mm -hmm. he had to leave for a half an hour and compose himself. And then if you, you, so there's that, but then if you listen to the act or you read the article that we read with the actors, everybody, when they talk about this film, everybody, like even I, I found another one, Bob with like uh, Kiefer Sutherland was talking about it. Mm -hmm. All of them talk about this experience with nothing but like this, like profound, deep love. Absolutely. It transcends from the, the whole process of the filmmaking to the, to the experience of the viewer watching it. I feel like we're wrapping up. We probably should. Yeah. Um, yep. There's always things, you know, Bob, I'm sure we're leaving some things on the table or, you know, but I think we had a really great discussion about this. Um, do you have no, any I other? I, no, I just, just, I just want to, I just reiterate what I said before is I I'm thanks for the pick. You made me kind of rediscover the film. And I think it's, it's indicative of this idea that you can continue to rediscover this film as you get older, generally yeah. every decade. And I think for me, doing this podcast and talking about it helped me not only rediscover the film, but as you said, like I, I'm, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring and say I think it might be – it's like a masterpiece. So I'm just – thanks thanks for recommending it and, and talking about it in this forum and, and discovering it in that way was just priceless. So thanks for that. So today we were talking about uh, Rob Reiner's 1986 film Stand By Me. The birthday pod. This is your gift to everyone listening. It's my gift to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say I have the flu right now. Did you ask? I was. I had this like queued up as my joke at the beginning of the episode. You're going to ask me, how you doing, Mike? I was going to say, I feel like Ray Brower right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> Can I, oh, I, I hate to tack this on at the very end, but I did want to okay, say I'm going to make this. you edit it out, so go ahead. No, like I just wanted to say that I think it's really important that they showed Ray Brower. Like you actually see oh, sure. the dead kid in the film. Oh, yeah. It makes it real. It does. And yeah, right. I think in this film in particular, like we were talking about, I know they're completely different, but we were talking about audition and like how we don't see the needles where they're going, you know, like, and that was better mm -hmm. because our imaginations like will create a better, like more terrifying idea of where that's going than actually just showing us where it's going. I think in this film, I just thought about like, well, in this context, like it's, it actually is super important to see, to see the body. And that's the name of the original story was the body like you need right. to see that if you don't see the body of ray brower then like everything is gonna you know it's gonna get watered down too much you need to see that you need to confront it with them right well bob as always thank you very much again this is we were talking about rob reiner's 1986 film stand by me happy birthday bud thanks man appreciate it